You say you have no creed but Christ? That's a nice creed you got there. On this edition of the Patriarchy Podcast, we're going to be talking about the need for confessions and creeds, and then begin a deep dive into the Westminster Confession of Faith. So join us as we build, fight, protect, and lead. This is the Patriarchy. Rise up, O men of God, have done with lesser... Rise up, up O men of God, of God one time have one done another. with lesser things. Give heart and mind and soul and strength and serve the King of Kings. Lift high the cross of Christ, tread where he is beaten and drawn. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth one confesses unto salvation. That was Romans 10, 9 and 10. And I am Pastor Joseph Spurgeon. You are listening to the Patriarchy Podcast, a ministry of Sovereign King Church. Speaking of Sovereign King Church... Our church is a confessional church. We are a Presbyterian church, part of Evangel Presbytery, and we adhere to the Westminster Confession of Faith. One of the goals that we've had this year at Sovereign King is to really ground ourselves in the basics of what we believe as taught in our Confession of Faith. You know, it's very easy in the age in which we live in with uh, social media and uh, just all the things around us to be a uh, like a blade of grass being blown about, to be tossed to and fro. There are fads that come up. There can even be interesting theologies that we get excited about and, and they could be true theologies and and it's good to be excited about these things but often we can get out on what i had a friend called them the skinny branches and spend all of our attention there and uh, one of the problems with that is uh it sometimes can be divisive other times it leaves you hanging out on the thinnest of 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 places without little support little grounding little foundation and you can lose track of the main thing, right? The Apostle Paul instructed us to build on the sure foundation, and we want to make sure that we have that foundation established and well well understood. And, and the truth is, it would take a lifetime, really, to really ground yourself and really understand deeply the truths of the Westminster Confession of Faith and catechisms as they summarize all of Scripture. But this is what we are about at Sovereign King Church. We want to be about the faith that has been given once for all to all the saints. We have the saying at our church is that we desire to be nothing new. We want to be vanilla Christianity that was taught in scriptures. I say vanilla, but vanilla is a good flavor. <laughs> it really is, right? Uh, um, it's really the grounding for a whole lot of good stuff. And so there's nothing boring. And actually in our day in which people hate God, they rebel, the, the plain truths of Scripture are powerful. They change the lives of those who hold to them. And they are hated, hated and despised by all those who hate God. And so they're constantly under attack, something we constantly need to be secure in. And that's one of the reasons we even have the confession in the first place, to make it clear what we believe. And so uh, what I want to do here uh, on the podcast is kind of mirror what some of the things we're doing at the church. We have all of our ministries right now are really trying to ground themselves in the confession or the catechisms. 
children's ministry, our men's ministry, women's ministry, teaching that we do. Uh, and we are going to start a series today going through the Westminster Confession of Faith. Uh, we're not going to get it all done today, not even close. Today's just the introduction. And you'll see this is a long episode. So we will be coming out with probably uh, long episodes like this, uh, just every other episode or so, diving into the Westminster Confession of Faith. There will be other episodes with other interviews and those kinds of things. But uh, I think it'll be just helpful to walk through and see uh, what what uh, Scripture teaches about the very foundations of our faith. We want to hold fast to this confession. And so I'm going to have with me today a guy that's been on my podcast before. He's been on twice, actually. He did a debate on the issue of baptism. We did a class on the nature of the new covenant. And he uh, leads our men's ministry at Sovereign King and has been working us through the Westminster Confession of Faith. So he's going to come on. This is going to be pretty deep. We're going to get pretty deep into some good discussion here today on the need of creeds and confessions. We're going to talk even at the beginning on uh, what is Presbyterian ecclesiology. Uh, it, it's a helpful kind of introduction to understand what the church government is. Now, if you're if you're from a Baptist or another background, hang out with us and, and learn from us. This I think you'll still be encouraged whether you agree with every jot and tittle. Uh, that's okay. I think you can learn from us and and from this discussion and if maybe you'll have helpful things to contribute which you can leave in the different comments of uh, or send messages to us but i think you're going to enjoy our time today i don't want to take up any more time here at the beginning so let's get right into it why why start with church government maybe well the uh the study that we did to, before we even started going through the westminster confession was kind of geared towards the needs of our our church, what we thought would be helpful for uh, the men in our church to understand and to pass down to their families, uh, that we need to major in the majors and, and, and stop majoring in the minors so we can get all wrapped up in things that, like the baptism debate, eschatology, theonomy, politics, uh, you name it. Uh, but those things are, are worth talking about, but we need to have a deeper understanding of the essentials of the Christian faith and the history behind uh, why we do church the way that we do it um, so that we're not sort of blind and things are just happening to us, but we understand why we do the things that we do in our church. And we have a mixture of Credo Baptist and Pado Baptist in our church, but we are still a Presbyterian church, and that could be confusing. So when we did our study, I asked kind of a trick question at the beginning. I asked how many people here were Baptist, and uh, we had a hand raised, and we had one of our elders who is a credo Baptist did not raise his hand and it caused a little bit of confusion. Uh, but the point being that we're talking about church government and not the mode and timing of baptism. That's not what really distinguishes between Presbyterians and everybody else. Um, so we saw a specific need to uh, explain what being a Presbyterian means uh, we live in a time where we uh, do lock arms with brothers who are Baptist. Uh, and even in our own church, like I said, we have Credo Baptist. But we do believe that the Presbyterian form of government is the biblical model. And so we wanted to start there. And uh, it's all. Okay, well, so what, let me, what is then, uh, what is Presbyterian? What does that mean then? Presbyterian? <laughs> Well, uh, I, I wanted to kind of use the study guide that I used for uh, our, our men's group we call the Genevan Pub. 
And I just kind of wanted to go through it and, and read what I wrote because I wrote it for a reason. It, it, I think it'll be helpful. Uh, I've shared my screen uh, with us. So what does it mean to be a Presbyterian? I'd like to just read some of this. Uh, it's been a couple of months since we went through it, so it, it's going to help me too. Um, Sovereign King Church is a Presbyterian church, but what does this mean? The word Presbyterian comes from the Bible and has its roots in the Greek word presbyteros, meaning elder. To put it simply, a Presbyterian church is a Christian church that is governed or ruled by spiritual leaders called elders. God has always taught us that his people need leaders, shepherds over his flock, and God provides these leaders in the various offices of the church. And uh, Sovereign King Church is a part of a a denomination called the Evangel Presbytery. And our book of church order says this, the whole polity of the church consists in doctrine, government, and distribution. And the ordinary and perpetual officers in the church are pastors or ministers of the word who are commissioned to preach the gospel and administer the sacraments. There's ruling elders whose office is to have the government and spiritual oversight of the church and deacons whose office is to collect and administer the people's offerings of mercy and benevolence and to minister to their physical and material needs. In accordance with the scripture, these offices are open to men only. So this is pretty standard uh, Presbyterianism. We have elders, and there's two kinds of elders. Uh, those that are called pastors or ministers of the word, sometimes called teaching elders. And we also have deacons, and we believe that they should all be men uh, as opposed to women, right? Yep. Uh, so. Uh, or, 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 uh, 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 well, the, the, what's the always the joke? We have uh, both kinds of, uh, what's, what's the gender joke about pastors? There's a third, the third gender. Uh, that's right. Yeah. Right. We, we want men, not the third gender kind. That's right. Uh, that's a sad joke. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Sorry. Yeah, that actually makes me think of, uh, you know, this is the patriarchy podcast. So what does this have to do with the patriarchy, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, that th the fact that the church is to be governed by officers that are men has something to do with the patriarchy, doesn't it? And the fact that we're going back to our roots uh, with the Westminster Confession, we're, we're trying to honor our fathers uh, by understanding the hard work that they put in to teach us and uh, the generations that came after uh, the Westminster Assembly that have uh, adopted and depended on the confession. Uh, we we want to honor our fathers. And, and I think that that has something to do with the patriarchy as well. So that's mm -hmm. a side note, but this is not... Uh, off topic for your channel, I guess you could say. Yep. Um, but back to the lesson here, uh, we see the three offices, uh, officers, offices, <laughs> uh, pastors, that's the teaching elders, ministers of the word, ruling elders, and deacons. The body of elders within a church are called the session. So this is some unique Presbyterian language. The, the group of men that are the elders in the church as a group are called the session. Uh, elders are nominated and then later voted on by the congregation as our deacons. So they're, they're not, uh, elders are not made just by other elders, but the congregation actually votes on who becomes an elder. So there, there's almost like a sense of checks and balances here within this. That's right. And it's similar to our form of government we have in the United States. So our uh, representative republic is actually mirrored after Presbyterian uh, church government in that the people select representatives for, for themselves, but then those rep representatives exercise that authority. We don't just vote every time a topic comes up the representative makes the decisions. Mm -hmm. But initially 
that representative is chosen by a vote. And there are two kinds of innocence representatives in in our in our I'm thinking federal government. You have House of Representatives and senators. And I think that also is mirrored here um, in uh, you have two types of elders, right? You have your, you have pastors, what we just call them pastors or ministers of the word teaching elders. And, and just like senators, they're, they're probably held to a higher, they're held to a higher standard, at least initially, as far as being able to teach. And uh, 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 it's not, I don't know that it's necessarily a biblical requirement, but it's it's a wise thing that they have some kind of formal education within uh, um, sometimes seminary or pastor's college, but uh, some kind of teaching skills that they've been taught themselves so they can handle the word appropriately. Um, it doesn't mean that the ruling elders are not able to teach. They need to be able to teach, but there's there's just this distinction there. Yeah, and that distinction is biblical as well, because uh, not everybody in the new, as the New Testament describes the church, uh, there are those that were ruling elders and then who are worthy of double honor, but it's especially those that uh, labor in the word. And so there is a biblical distinction there. It isn't just you know, practical because we don't have enough seminary graduates or something like that, but it is a biblical uh, distinction. All right, we'll continue on. Yeah, let's go. Uh, the uh, session Thanks. meetings here uh, may occur that include elders only. So sometimes in a, in a Presbyterian church, the elders will just meet, but sometimes the deacons will be included. Uh, elders will discuss and vote on matters pertaining to the worship of the church. So the structure of, of the worship, you know, they can make decisions about when uh, the, the sermon happens versus communion or wh when how many songs are sung, things like that. Uh, discipline. So who in the church may need uh, a talking to or further kind of discipline uh, in the general direction of its focus and growth. So, you know, you have certain goals set by the elders sort of uh, behind closed doors on behalf of the rest of the church, because you can't just do everything all at once. You, ne you need to pick a direction. Uh, depending on the denomination, pastors uh, may refrain from voting. So the, past, the, the teaching elder or the minister of the word might not actually vote with the ruling elders to make decisions in the church unless it's to break a tie. And I, and that's another kind of check or balance there, I think, uh, because the, the, the pastor or the minister of the word does at least perceptually have more influence over the church. I, I think in, in our denomination, how this works is often, it's really about the size of the, the congregation or the size of the session board. So when you're small like us, and you have two elders, right? Uh, uh, I vote more often, but uh, I'm also the moderator with, of the session meetings. I lead the session meetings, so it's my job to, to at times try to be uh, uh, like Switzerland, <laughs> but not you know, uh, uh, I'm not necessarily neutral. But in order to try, I'm, I'm there to try to make sure that the meeting can flow. And that uh, the elders are able to speak their opinion and that agreement can be made. So uh, it could be wise to not vote. It could be wise to vote. Uh, I don't know if necessarily there's a scriptural basis for either way necessarily other than the use of biblical wisdom. Right. And you want to avoid an abuse of your power as a, a pastor. Yep. Because the ruling elders are also ruling elders. So you, you can see the distinction be, between kind of a, a business model for churches where the pastor is the CEO and gets the final say. Uh, so it, it really is about recognizing 
the sinful tendencies that the Bible teaches that we have and restraining that uh, by the form of government that we believe the Bible teaches. Um, now, beyond individual church sessions, so our church, for example, as you said, there's two ruling elders and you're the uh, pastor, the teaching elder. Uh, outside of that, uh, there's a greater presbytery where individual congregations are united in accountability to a larger body. So you all are also accountable to the other elders, uh, teaching and ruling elders within the area that we are a part of a denomination of. We're in that presbytery. Uh, the presbytery consists of all the teaching and ruling elders within a geographical era area presbyteries meet at a regularity between monthly and quarterly some half yearly and those meetings will have an appointed moderator and clerk so um you all get together <laughs> and hash things out right yeah so you know there are we meet quarterly um i believe that's right uh every three months yeah three to four months uh so we have, i we have a we may meet three times a year i, <laughs> I ought to know this better uh, we just met we just met at our church we have a winter and i know we have a fall and i know we have summer so i, I think that uh we may meet three times but uh um uh but we also have committees and groups of the men that do work that meet in between those meetings but uh we gather together and we'll decide uh, issues of of government or that involves all the churches or could even be discipline of a particular church or a particular pastor. Uh, could be uh, uh, in, encouraging in church planting, um, praying for each other. Um, we've been very blessed. There's a lot of agreement in our presbytery. And so we've been able to do a lot of work on uh, important issues. I think like we just, we've worked on writing a book on abortion and um, uh, other things like that. So, uh, but we're not just speaking of our presbytery. We're talking about presbytery in general. So some of them may meet uh, more regularly or some less. Right. And it is, it's really a matter of, what works best for all the people I'm just making a wise decision. This isn't something that the Bible says explicitly, but it's something that we use uh, good and necessary consequence to deduce uh, what, what's wise about mm -hmm. that. So it, it isn't necessarily, this is exactly what the Bible says, but we're going to get to that too. Um, when denominations are very large, so you've got like the PC USA or the PCA or, pretty big Presbyterian denominations. Uh, they will consist of numerous presbyteries. So, you know, you've got churches up in Oregon and churches down in Florida. They're not going to have meetings uh, together as, it, every few months. It, it's just too difficult. So there'll be multiple presbyteries, but then uh, those presbyteries will have a, a a court where they're all together, uh, they're called synods and general assemblies. And the synod being a lower court and the general assembly being the higher or the highest court for that denomination. So typically they'll meet once a year. And yep. they will have, the, it, it will not be a meeting of all the, the pastors and the ruling elders, but representatives even from within pres the presbyteries themselves will go because it, it's just too many people, but they're still trying to uh, live the example that's put down in scripture uh, for us. Well, it's, uh, a, it's again, it's a lot like our system of courts in our own country of lo local jurisdiction courts. And then you have appellate courts and then higher appellate courts. And then you have the Supreme court. And so. Right. And like, you're also talking about, uh, within the denomination, there'll be people who deal with different subjects. That's like committees. Uh, 
uh, for Congress or senators, they'll sit on different committees that just to address certain issues because not everybody can do everything, right? And that's kind of the example of uh, Moses being told to select men to help him with his responsibilities. And uh, it, that kind of comes from the Old Testament into the New, that example of appoint, appointing men to share responsibilities. Uh, so I want to go through through some text. Uh, yeah, this so isn't exhaustive, but this is text that uh, teach us something in bits and pieces, at least, about uh, elders and deacons and their authority and the qualifications needed for them. So I'm going to switch screens here. Uh, these aren't really in any particular order, but they have information that we can glean from them. In uh, 1 Corinthians 12, Paul says that God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles and gifts of healing, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. So the important thing here, we could have a debate about if apostles still exist or tongues or gifts of healings. But the important thing for this discussion is that God appointed teachers, helps people to help the church. Everybody's supposed to help, but this is a certain uh, kind of person that's appointed in administrations. Administrations is like um, managers. Uh, Acts 20, uh, 17 from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. Be on your guard for yourselves and for all your flock. The Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. So we're, we're being taught here by Paul that uh, he appointed elders uh, and that they're called overseers and their job is to shepherd the church of God. So we know that Jesus is the great shepherd, Right. But he also appointed people to be shepherds of the church of God. Uh, Jesus purchased it with his own blood, he says. But then he appoints people to help manage it. Uh, Romans 12. Uh, stop to this for just a second. This is yeah. a very important thing is that if you noticed here in both of these, we said earlier that the church votes and select them as representatives. And there's a truth of that in which they are selected or, or voted on by the congregation. We can talk about They're why. Approved, approved of. Approved by, by it. But who is the one really appointing or making the elders? Well, as you just said, God appointed, and then the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. That's very important because as I read it as a pastor, it, it hits me on two fronts. One is, since God has done it, I, I, that's who I answer to. Yes, the church has voted and has approved it, and that I think God works through his church to show who he has made overseers. So God works with his people to, to do this, but God is the one that does it, which means uh, unlike, we've said it's like our civil government, but unlike the civil government, my job is not to pander to different voters and, and have constituents and uh, um, to uh, think of myself constantly as a representative of the people. Rather, it's to be reminded that the people's voting was God's use of putting me in the office that I answer to God. And so uh, he will hold me accountable, which is why it's a very important thing. But it also hits me on another thing in that well, if God holds me accountable, God's also established me as this, then I have God's authority when I carry out my work in accordance to obedience to him. Right? So uh, I can preach with not my own authority, my own charisma, the, my own all that. Uh, we can make decisions on discipline not from my own weaknesses and all those things, but with the authority of God. And that's why we'll see later on that you're supposed to be subject to your elders. You're supposed to obey. 
It's because the Holy Spirit made them overseers. And when you disobey your overseers, you're disobeying the Holy Spirit. That's a big deal in Scripture. All right, keep going. Yeah, so there. what's the Spider-Man quote? With great power comes great responsibility. It's kind yep. of the balance you're talking about there. If, if it is God who has appointed you to that position, and that's what Acts 20 just says, the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, then you answer to God. But the, the other side of that is if you are doing your job as an overseer uh, in an honorable way, then the people that you're shepherding, your sheep, should listen to you. And, and honor that authority. Uh, let, let's go on and get through some of these texts because it'll teach us more about it. Uh, Romans 12, starting at 6. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each, is a, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So I've highlighted uh, the, these aspects of what is expected out of elders uh, to teach, exhort, and to lead. And these are gifts, which means they have to be given by God. And not everyone has them. Okay, because uh, they differ according to the grace given to us. Uh, and also this section of he who gives with liberality is, is often taken to mean actually the office of a deacon because it is the deacon's responsibility to give to the members of the church that are in need. It isn't just that's the congregation giving to the church, but the church gives back. First uh, Peter 5 Therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God. Not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, uh, nor yet is lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So just in this section alone, uh, it's interesting that Peter calls himself a fellow elder. So even though he was an apostle, uh, he was a fellow elder to those other elders that were not apostles. So he was, in a, he was in the office of an apostle. We know that he was an apostle, but he also held the office of an elder. And so there's a distinction between the two. Uh, and uh, he's told that the position is voluntary. Uh, it's according to the will of God. And he tells the younger men to be subject to the elders. That's what you were talking about earlier. The the authority that's given to the elder means that those under him should be subject to them. Now, this is similar to uh, Romans 13, right? Uh, the um, authority is instituted by God. That's talking about the authority that wields the power of the sword. That's the civil government. But in the same way, the authority within the church, you're supposed to be subject to that as well. And interestingly enough, in that section of Romans 13, uh, the civil government is called God's deacon. It says God's servant in some translations. It's actually mm -hmm. the word for deacon. Um, I'm going to go on. Uh, 1 Timothy 3, uh, I'm not going to read all this. This is the qualifications for being an elder or a deacon. Uh, and so one thing that this teaches us, apart from how a person should be, 
if they're put in that position. It does teach that, but it teaches us that that position is an office. If you look at verse one, it is a trust, trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. And then it gives the qualifications. So we know that an, an elder isn't just like an older person in the church that is a little bit smarter and wiser that everybody looks up to. This is an actual office that exercises authority. Mm -hmm. uh, and likewise, uh, deacons hold an office as well, and they have qualifications similar to that of an elder, really. Uh, Titus 1. For this reason, I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remain, what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Uh, so here Paul is telling Titus uh, to continue to uh, appoint elders in every city. So we know that the office of elders was supposed to be in, in the churches everywhere. This isn't just a uh, isolated thing to um, like a, a hierarchy thing, but there's elders everywhere. Like the Pope is in Rome, right? He's the, he's the, uh, the Bishop of uh, Rome. Uh, and so he has more authority, but no, the authority in the New Testament church is that there's elders everywhere in every city. Um, first Timothy one, five, the elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. So there, there are elders who rule and there are those who preach and teach. So, and th this is where we make that distinction between the, the pastor uh, the the teaching elder versus the ruling elders who don't who don't necessarily don't necessarily do all the hard work of preaching and teaching. Nevertheless, they rule. They have some kind of authority in the church. Mm -hmm. uh, Ephesians four is is important for a lot of reasons, but uh, he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers. For the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. Until we all attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the statue which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So, again, there were apostles and prophets, right? And But also pastors and teachers. Not everyone was an apostle. Not everyone was a prophet. Not everyone is a pastor, not everyone is a teacher, but God has appointed some. He gave it to them. It's a gift. If you remember, actually, this this uh, passage is speaking about how Jesus uh, ascended. He descended to the earth and then led captives free and ascended to the heavens, giving gifts along the way. Right. All right. And the gifts he gave to the church, like so he gave to the gift church, uh, 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 and it's people that he gave, basically. The gifts are the offices that he gave and, and the people that he gave to serve in those offices. Like Jesus is the one, again, that establishes this. You see That's this right. through. It's so important that you get this because I think at a conclusion statement we're going to make here in a minute, uh, but uh, um, it's important that you recognize that this is established by Jesus. And uh, it's it's a gift to equip us for the work to build up the body of Christ. Yeah, and if you believe that Christ is Lord, that He ascended into heaven, you believe what the Bible says that in doing so He gave gifts. Now, if Jesus ascends to heaven, He leaves earth and goes to heaven. What's a great gift that He can give us? Some authority. Uh, in his place on earth to, to represent him. Uh, he is the chief shepherd, but those called to the office of elder are also shepherds. They're overseers. And he gave those. And if you do not believe that the church is supposed to have elders that have these qualifications and, and operate with this kind of authority, then you don't believe what the Bible says about what Christ has done for us. And we should not despise God's gifts. We really should not. 
uh, and we do have a problem in our day, and it's understandable for you know historical, psychological, cultural reasons that people are afraid to submit to church leadership. But you have to believe that God has given us qualified men to oversee churches and that you should submit to their leadership. This is black and white. Well, it's highlighted in yellow here too, but <laughs> this is the word of God for, for all of you, just me and my Bible guys. This is the word of God that you're saying. It's just you in that Bible. Obey your leaders and submit to them for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. There's that double-edged sword there of, of authority and responsibility. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. Acts 14. Let me let me just uh, briefly mention about that. About the uh, Go back up just a second. About people giving you a hard time? Yeah, the joy and not with grief. It'd be unpro- yeah. well, I'm just going to focus on the part of be unprofitable for you. All right. The again, if these are gifts God gave the church to build us up, then if we submit to the leaders God gives us, and we do it in a way that makes it joyful, and it's profitable for us. All right. When we belly ache and we grumble or we fight and we resist, it's unprofitable. It gives it gives pastors grief. Right there because true shepherds of God's people are going to love the people that God has given them and it grieves them. We we're, we're going through first Samuel and um, we just finished on where Saul has been rejected by God. And yet it says God, it grieved God hmm. and it grieved Samuel. And if you grieve your pastors and elders, they're, they're, they're men. They're not supposed to do this so much, but they will give up on trying to help you and then it won't be profitable for you. So we want it's 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 amazing that that's what it connects it to. It's not that it'll be profitable for the the leaders, right? Right. It'll are, just make things easier for them. There's false teachers who want that so that it will be profitable. You know what I mean, like that. Right. But the real point of this is it's profitable for you to submit to those who keep watch over your souls. Anyways, go. Uh, uh, Right. So that, I, that's where the gift part comes in, right? It's yeah. there to teach and to lead and to oversee and to shepherd you for your sake. And unfortunately, yeah, there are people that take advantage of this position. That's why there's qualifications in there. And, and that's why there's also uh, checks and balances and oversight. So that those wolves in, in sheep's clothing that Paul warns the church in Ephesus about in the book of Acts, he warns, it's right after the, what we read earlier, uh, he warns them that uh, from amongst themselves will arise wolves. Well, what's the shepherd supposed to do? Protect you from the wolves, protect the sheep from the wolves. And God has put that in place. You need to trust God uh, that he's done that. And there are people uh, qualified and eligible for this. Uh, Otherwise, what are we doing? What, you know, are we are we playing church, or do we believe that God actually made the church, and he and he is growing and maturing that church? Do we believe that? Uh, Acts fourteen. Uh, this is just another verse that uh, in verse twenty three, when they had appointed elders for them in every church, so the elders should be in every church in every congregation. And another thing that we learn from this the structure uh, is that there are many churches, but it's just one church, right? We, we have to derive that from what we've learned in the scripture, just because there's every church, there's a church in this city, there's a church over here, the churches have different elders in them, but they're still all a part of the church, the one that's purchased by the blood of Jesus that Paul uh, warns. So what you're saying is there, there's not in scripture, the autonomy of the local church. That is this separation of churches and each church does exactly what it wants to do and without any disregard or without any regard to the other churches. Yeah. The rest of the body, 
Each church is a body, but the church is also one body. So you are a part of other churches. Now, we have so much denominational conflict and differences, but as Presbyterians, we do our best to uh, live the example of the New Testament church by being part of Presbyterians, by being uh, having sister churches that the elders are a part of larger bodies. We're, we're trying to, to live out the commandments the scripture gives us. It would be great if we every church in the world decided to want to o- obey that. But right now we're at least trying with the churches that do. One, one more thing about this verse I'm thinking of. It says when they had appointed, who was they? It, it was the the... It was the apostles here, right? Right. And so, but it's interesting is that we said earlier that it was the Holy Spirit that appointed. The Holy Spirit did all these things. God did this. Jesus did this. But now it's they had appointed them. And so what we're seeing is this, uh, that God works through his church, through his people, and particularly through the apostles in establishing this. But the apostles call them, Selves, fellow elders, we, we see that in other passages, and we're about to see it in Acts 15. And the point is that uh, God works through the church to appoint his leaders, and when they work, it's the Holy Spirit working. Uh, the Holy Spirit works through his people. Right, and so that's the means by which the Holy Spirit is working, is the apostles and the elders uh the the teachers the deacons these offices in the church god is using them as a means to work in the church himself uh we are the temple of the holy spirit right Mm -hmm. that not just individuals but the church itself uh let's read acts 15 see if i pull it up here that's six We'll go to 15 here. It's long. This is the uh, Council of Jerusalem. So they had the conflict. Uh, there, some men came down from J- Judea and began teaching the brethren, brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So they've got this problem in the uh, early church, the, uh, the circumcision party as it's called elsewhere. And how are they going to solve this problem? How do we solve this conflict? And this is a great example for how we should solve theological conflicts within the body of Christ. Paul and Barnabas had a great dissension and debate with them. The brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. Therefore, being sent on their way by the church. They were passing through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and were bringing great joy to all the brethren. When they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up saying, it it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter. Why don't you stop right there just a second, Zach? Yeah. Back up just a little bit. We see there's this issue going on, and the local church sends its leaders, Paul and Barnabas, to gather with the rest of the broader church. And it's very important that it's the apostles and elders concerning the issue. Now, we know the apostles are the ones that had the authority to write Scripture, and they led. But in matters of issue of church government, we see here that the apostles and elders are deciding these things together. Right? These are the apostles have determined to give the authority of church government to the elders, and we see them working together in this. And they are received in Jerusalem by the church, which that's important to think of what church in Jerusalem. I'm sure there were many local congregations. So we're speaking broadly of the whole church. 
which is speaking of the apostles and elders and their representative together. And then they're the ones that came together to look into the matter. Who who came to look into the matter? Wasn't every congregation person sitting in the congregation, apostles and elders. And then verse seven, uh, um, you'll see they something. Had a, that, they had a presbytery meeting. Basically, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Verse seven, after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by the mouth of the Gentiles, uh, that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. And he made no distinction between uh, us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither of our fathers, nor we have been able to bear. But we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are. All the people kept silent, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they were relating what signs and wonders God had done done through them among the Gentiles. You've got this, uh, this is, is a Presbytery meeting, and you've got a debate on an issue, right? They're debating. So we, debate is not bad. Argument is not bad. It's actually how God works in his people. They were debating this issue. And Peter gets up, just like a, a pastor may do in a presbytery meeting, and makes an argument. And then the people are continuing to listen. And they're listening now to Paul and Barnabas, who have been sent by the church there. And now you've got uh, a, a, another apostle who's going to get up or another leader who's going to get up and speak. So keep, keep going there. Verse 13. After they had stopped speaking, James answered saying, brethren, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles, a people for his name. With this, the words of the prophet agree, just as it is written. After these things, I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David which has fallen and I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles are recalled by my name, says the Lord who makes these things known from long ago. Therefore, it is my judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles, but that we write to them that they abstain from things uh, contaminated by idols and from fornication and from that which is uh, strangled, and from blood. For Moses, from ancient generations, has in every city those who preach him, since he is read in the synagogue every Sabbath. So okay. what do you have happening here? So uh, James gets up, and he uses the Old Testament scriptures that describes the uh, restoration of the tabernacle of David as involving uh, the Gentiles who were called by God's name. So basically, James is proving from the Old Testament that the restoration of the tabernacle of David is the inclusion of the Gentiles. That's what's happening in the New Testament church. It goes to the Jew first, then the Gentile. And then because of this, uh, James offers a verdict. And uh, then what you have is an agreement with the verdict that James is like the moderator here almost. Everyone's been listened to, and now James gives a final word. Yeah, and he, he makes an argument from Scripture, and then an application of that, also using wisdom, right? Right. Verse 21, for Moses, right, so why should they abstain from things contained by idols and from fornication? Well, that's what Scripture teaches, but also strangled and from blood. Why the blood thing? Well, because... Moses from ancient generations, as in every city, those who preach him, right? Uh, basically, they're saying these are the basic things that have been taught by Moses, and they're spread throughout by the Gentiles too. And and furthermore, uh, uh, um, and, and this argument really is to keep from the peace of the church. Right. It's by laying down what Scripture says, receiving the Gentiles, but also just placing on them the bare minimum, basically the things that have been 
preached already everywhere by about Moses. And so, and has also maintained the peace with the the Jewish converts as well regarding Right. This. So there's, we could get into the details of why they decided on these uh, rules, mm-hmm. but it, it boils down to a matter of, like you said, keeping the peace between the, the Jews that had converted, but they were still devout and everything they had learned uh, was still significant to them. And, and then you had the Gentiles coming in and, it, and it's an issue of wisdom and, and respect for one another to keep the peace. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a matter of governing the church, basically. It's, it's governing the church for the glory of God and according to his word, using the wisdom of the word. Right. Paul later, uh, Paul talks about how, you know, an idol is nothing and, you know, it yeah. doesn't matter uh, if you eat it, you know, if you don't know it, like it's fine. But in this circumstance here, uh, in order to keep the peace, it's determined. Yeah, just don't do it. Right. Yeah. Don't don't offend your your Jewish brothers here. Uh, it uh, don't. Uh, offend their conscience. Yeah, I, I think I would even argue that, that other place in Scripture, you're talking about First Corinthians, is Paul explaining their 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 reasoning here, right? So yeah, oh, yeah, it's not it's not really that it's a thing, but you get it for the peace of your brother. You don't food is not that the thing the fight over, right? Right. It's also worth noting here that James is talking about how Moses is read in the synagogues every Sabbath, and that you what you really do have in the New Testament church model is sort of an imitation of the synagogue model. The church is not uh, just a replacement of the temple system, but you know Jesus goes and reads in, in the synagogue. James here is referencing uh, how Moses is read in the synagogue every Sabbath, and the the church's meetings sort of imitated that synagogue system, even though it wasn't explicitly described or ordained by God in the Old Testament to have these synagogues. What you have is an outworking of the principles of scripture that helped form that synagogue system for the Mm -hmm. Jews. And the, the New Testament essentially approves of it and imitates it. That, that's kind of a side note, but it's interesting to think about. Verse 22 is where we left off there. Right. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them to send to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. Judas called uh, Barsabbas and Silas, leading men among the brethren, and they sent this letter by them. The apostles and the brethren who are elders to the brethren in Antioch, Syria, uh, Cilicia, who are from the Gentiles, greetings. Since we have heard that some of our numbers to whom we gave no instruction have disturbed you with their words, unsettling your souls, it seemed good to us, having become of one mind, to select men to send to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we have sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will also report the same things by word of mouth, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Wait, wait a second. What? Go ahead. Right. Where, where was the Holy Spirit when he said this, by the way? Did he show yeah. up? Or are they operating under the assumption that the Holy Spirit is guiding them? Yeah, it when, good, in the work of the church. Yeah, in the work of the church. That's right. It it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials: that you abstain from things sacrificed to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication. If you keep yourselves free from such things, you will do well. Farewell. So the Presbyterian meeting resulted in a letter that is essentially a command to the churches. It, it's binding to them. Uh, it's no greater burden than these essentials, but they are still essentials, and those essentials were still binding on those churches. 
So they, they had authoritative, they have made an authoritative decision at this meeting of apostles and elders. That bound other churches that were not there. That's right. right. They weren't right. there. Not or, or maybe their congregational there. meeting. Yeah. Now, they did have a congregational meeting about it next, if you read verse 30, right? Right, that's right. They gathered with the congregation, uh, congregation and delivered the letter. And they rejoiced and were encouraged by it. So uh, the information was delivered eventually to the whole congregation, but the decisions and the authority uh, existed with the elders and, and the apostles at the time who equated themselves as fellow elders. And then look at verse 32. You've got, you got to include this verse. Just. Okay. Judas and Silas also being prophets themselves encouraged and strengthened the brethren with a lengthy message. I just wanted to see the lengthy message, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> they encouraged and strengthened them with a lengthy message. So there you go. Yeah, don't get too bogged down just because something is uh, long and in-depth or, or takes time to study. Um, be encouraged by it and strengthen it. Keep, keep scrolling down a little bit. It might be in the next chapter, but uh, uh, there's another section that deals with this, this one more thing. Keep going. Hello, I'm Pastor Joseph Spurgeon, and welcome to Sovereign King Church. Here at Sovereign King Church, we exist because our King Jesus Christ has called us out of darkness into the light. When we were sinners, struggling, unable to fend for ourselves against our enemies. God sent his son and rescued us. And so we exist because of Jesus. Jesus is the sovereign king. We exist to confess that Jesus Christ is king. And we are going to proclaim that Jesus Christ is king to all the world. And therefore, we're going to also build our lives, construct our lives on what Christ has done for us and construct our lives on the commands of our king. Wherever you're at in your spiritual journey, there's a place here for you. You don't have to agree with all of the things that we preach here. So wherever you're at and, and how you know God and who you know Him to be as the Scriptures command, there's a place for you here because we're all going to get from one level of glory to the next. All of us started out from a you know, bare bones foundation and we've grown. There's a place for you to serve in Sovereign King Church. Are you talking about as they passing through the cities, they were delivering the decree? Yeah, verse four. Decide? Yes. Yes, that's the verse I was looking at. Verse four. Thank you. So they were delivering what? The decree. decrees. Decrees. Right. Yeah. Which had been decided upon by the elders and the apostles and elders for them to observe. Right. And the churches were strengthened in the faith and were increased in number daily by the work of that presbytery meeting. That's right. So we, we, what we get from this is a model for how the church should deal with disputes and issues. Um, this isn't just a one-time thing because the church still has disputes and issues. Uh, we have different kinds of debates today and we've had different kinds of debates in the past. But what Paul tells us in Ephesians, I believe it was chapter two earlier, uh, is that the church is growing in maturity. These disputes and issues lead to resolutions that s strengthen the church and grow the church. That's what we learned from uh, Acts 15 and then going into 16 here. So uh, I want to get back to talking about uh, Presbyterian government. Now, th uh, it's not intended to be exhaustive, but introductory. This, this conversation we've just had is really introductory to the concept of Presbyterian polity. That is another word for church government. Uh, I would recommend as a, a good, uh, excellent discourse on Presbyterian polity. There is this uh, book 
the divine right of church government. And What's it called it, in Latin? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just the venom, regimentus, ecclesiastic. See. <laughs> All right. Good job. Thanks. Uh, and uh, it is for free online. Uh, the book's authors were a collection of sundry ministers of Christ within the city of London. Uh, this was a t at around the time of the writing of the Westminster Confession, uh, 1646. And uh, there's another thing, but let's look at this. This is for free online on purelypresbyterian.com. Uh, especially the last chapter, it's the conclusion. It's called Proof That Presbyterianism is Biblical. And it's written in the form of questions and answers. And uh, we're actually going to read some of this here later down the line. But I recommend that. And also, uh, there's another work. It was, it's the first uh, published commentary on the Westminster Confession called Truth, Victory Over Error uh, by David Dickerson. And that was in 1684. And uh, chapter 25 is called Of the Church. This, this is for free. This is actually the University of Michigan's website. For huh. some reason, it has a good version of this. Uh, chapter 25 is on the church. This, so uh, the first one, the divine right of church government, is more of an argument against uh, Roman Catholic doctrine and also Episcopalian form of government. And this truth victory over error is more uh, against uh, separatist or independent uh, churches, to, you know, Baptist type churches, independent fundamentalist Baptist type churches today. But back then they were called separatist. Um, I recommend both of those things if you want to go more in depth. Uh, one way we can think about this to better understand our Presbyterian polity is in contrast to Roman Catholic hierarchy. So the Catholics have a hierarchy among them. You know, the Pope's at the top. You have bishops uh, in charge of, what do they call them, arch, archbishops in charge of other bishops. So there's a real hierarchy as opposed to the Presbyterian polity, which the elders share authority. The, the teaching elder doesn't get the final say just because he teaches. He gets a vote with all the other ones. And the, there's not a geographical church that's in charge of another. Those elders meet and decide things together. Uh, ver and also to con uh, contrast it with uh, congregationalists, and that's where the church just votes on everything, right? Um, but we don't do that. Like we said earlier, the elders are representative of the congregation. And the congregations do have a say in who the elders are. So that there is uh, a division of power and authority. Um, now, the, the final paragraph I have here. Uh, at this point, it should be noted that we do not think that Presbyterian polity is just a good idea or a better idea among many options. We hold that it is the form of church government instituted by the Lord Jesus Christ. So we talked about that earlier. This God, God has established his church by Christ giving elders to the church and the Holy Spirit working through those elders and deacons. Um, we believe all varying doctrines are an error and are abuses of God's uh, God ordained authority that should be honored and obeyed. So you, if you have a hierarchy of elders, bishops, archbishops, whatever, what you have is an abuse of authority because that the authority that exists uh, is defined by God in the scriptures and, and it should not be um, puffed up. Uh, so this is abuses, whether in the hierarchy of uh, Roman Catholic or Episcopalian churches or those that would deny the authority and oversight, uh, that would be like a congregationalist uh, and separatist type churches. So we really do believe that this is the government that Jesus Christ instituted. 
Now, that does not mean that it's perfect. God is using imperfect men to exercise authority uh, and responsibility in his church. Uh, but they can still make mistakes. They're imperfect men. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to add to that? or? Well, uh, what would you say? I mean, we're, what we're not saying here is, let me just say what we're not saying is that necessarily that the Episcopals or the, let's say the independent fundamental Baptist or they're not a church or that this error is such that it leads to the denying of Christ necessarily. But it is an error in such that it makes things less profitable. Remember what said earlier about things being profitable, that when you follow the way that Christ has established, you are protecting from abuses, right? When you invest too much power in one person, aka the Pope, or even several people, like individuals that can appoint pastors or can appoint and and or dis or remove pastors, we see that have happened in Episcopal, or we see that happening in uh, in Rome. They've been some, some, I guess you might call them conservative priests, who have spoke out against some of the uh, woke kind of nonsense of the Pope, and they've been removed from office by archbishops, right? So you, you, when you, you're open yourself up for tyranny there, you have tyranny. And when you flip to the other area in which your church is isolated and there's no authority outside of the local church, um, even if it's led by elders, if there's no body of other elders and other, an other court to appeal to, you're left now with what could be a little popedom in a church, right? Where a pastor or a group of elders or one elder that hides in the sh shadows is making decisions and can't be opposed, or you're open to the the abuse of democracy. <laughs> we're not we're, we're we're not fans of democracy either, because it has its abuses, and. Um, Many, I've, I grew up in Baptist churches and served them. There are many faithful Baptists, so this is not an abash on them. But there were churches that I were part of where the pastor could not preach faithfully, or at least he didn't feel like he could f preach faithfully the Word of God because the congregation was constantly, you know, they're, they're the ones exercising the authority. There can't be church discipline. There couldn't be things. So checks and balances that Jesus established in his word and the offices that he does is the best way. It's a better idea among many, but not just that. It's actually the form that Jesus established. And we can explain why, but even without the why, we ought to be obedient to it. Right. And, you know, you it can also be abused. We look at the PCUSA, it's a Presbyterian Church that practice, practices Presbyterian polity, but they have steered away from so many other things. It doesn't matter if they have the, uh, the framework of good polity because they have placed women in those places of authority, which is uh, unbiblical. You know, our, our uh, book of church order with Evangelical Presbytery explicitly does not allow that to happen, but they've allowed it to happen over there. And they've opened a whole can of worms because of it. Um, just because you have the right structure doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to do the right things either. But it, the right structure is also obedience to God, right? So we're not saying it guarantees perfection, but it is what God has commanded for us to do. And, and then when we follow it and we obey it and we live by it and we try to strive to the principles of it, uh, it's certainly much better. And it can protect against the errors, the weaknesses, 
And uh, that's why I think one of the reasons that it fails is people don't understand or they don't seek to apply it and understand all the checks and balances. It's easy for it to go away when we get away from it. Right. So when one person becomes too powerful or a group of, uh, or there's disconnect from among the churches that ought to be working together, or when um, it becomes too congregational at a point too led by the people, or when the people check out and they don't, and they're not involved in leadership or, or not keeping their people accountable either. So you get the, it's like our form of, again, our form of civil government is great as long as the people are good, <laughs> right? Right. And when the people are not, their hearts are far from God, then it doesn't really matter what system you have. If your heart's far from God, it doesn't matter what system you have. Uh, it, it won't defend it, right? Um, right. God looks at our hearts. He established these things for our benefit, right? If you think about it, God has no need for Presbyterianism. Right? He don't need our church of government. Right. <laughs> it's for us. It's for us. So why can't why shouldn't we just obey it and, and live in it if it's for us? Obey him and, and give our hearts to him. But not to mistake that them thinking, okay, well, if this is for us, then you become like, well, a slave to the this thing while your heart's away from God. Well, we kept our, our Presbyterian principles as we followed the government thing to a T. And that's why we've ordained Sally Jim Bob over here, who's a half man, half woman thing. <laughs> right. So you're you're obeying one part of scripture but not another. Yep. You're not taking into account the whole counsel of God. And yeah. that, that's that's not gonna profit you. But we, we need to try to obey God God's entire counsel of mm -hmm. the whole scriptures. Um Well hey, we <clears throat> we are at an hour and 13 minutes and we are on part one of three parts for this introduction thing. <laughs> That's right. Uh, That's fine. Let's keep going, man. And then if I need to, I'll cut these up into to, uh, different podcasts, but that's what do you think? We can finish up in an hour. Uh, finish up on uh, maybe. All right, let's go through it. Let's, let's do it. Okay. So uh, the next thing we talked about in, in our own church's uh, study, um, it, because we're going into studying the Westminster Confession, is just about creeds and, and confessions in general. Uh, rugged individual, individualism is a common mindset among many American Christians. Uh, while there are good reasons to be competent, self-reliant in some areas of life, it is not God's plan for us to be so isolated and prideful that we neglect our place within our community and in history. So uh, this principle applies to Presbyterianism as a form of government, but also to just our place in, in time and history. Uh, through the years, God has grown and matured his church, and one of the ways he does so is in the maturity of understanding and doctrine. Uh, that's uh, uh, Ephesians 4. That's what we read earlier. You know, going back to that that thing about individualism and, and knowing our place, I, I think uh, we could do a whole episode on this. But the 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 thing is, I think we look at our culture, we look at everything, and how it, there's just sinfulness and wickedness, and our tendency is to retreat into ourselves and maybe just our family, right? And uh, yeah, and then we, we begin to be preppers. Yeah. You know, that's one tendency. And we see everybody else. Here's the issue with it. It's not that everybody else is not corrupted. They are. We all have a sinful nature, but that's how we tend to see everybody. Like, everybody's a part of this. We, we recognize the system sucks. Like, it's terrible. Like, uh, uh, I the, the, we just had the State of the Union thing with uh, President Biden, and that was a disaster. And then the Republicans come out with this little response to it was like a SNL skit. Uh, it was like, uh, I don't know if you saw that, Zach. It was like this yeah. woman. Uh, somebody recently put the Sarah McLaughlin song behind it, you know, the arms of an angel. So it sounds like the right. 
the adopt a pet thing. It's just a disaster. And so we all see that out there and we're tempted to grow bitter about it. And so now everybody out there is corrupted. The only person I can trust is me because I'm not corrupted. Which, what does scripture say? The human heart is wicked, right? Who can? Right. All of our hearts are wicked. All have sinned. Which is why you can't, you won't, you can't, you can't escape the issue by retreating within and, and becoming a prepper out in the middle of the woods. It doesn't mean there's never a place to live out in the woods and or a home do, church. Just yeah. do home church. Yeah. Just me and my family. That'll solve the issue. But does it really? No, because it's all there's all inside you enough to destroy the whole world three or four times. Yes, there right, is within your own heart. Uh there's this movie that I, I love it's called The Village. You ever seen that? The uh, M. Shyamalan? Yeah, it's one of his things. It didn't receive, like, people kind of hated it at the time because the commercials for the trailers made it seem like a big horror movie. But uh, I liked it. They live in a village that's like, okay, this would be great. It's like the 1800s. It's kind of like Little House on the Prairie. And they've got all these rules and stuff, and they can't go out into the woods. And sadly, one of their own boys kills one of the other boys. And they've got to send somebody out and they find out that, well, actually it's not the 1800s. It's modern life. And these people have retreated and created their own village to try to escape all the evils out there. And it followed them right into their own village with the murder coming from one of their own sons. Right. And I, I, that's a good lesson because I'm tempted that way. And so as we think about this, the reason I'm diving into a little bit more, is you need the church. The church needs each other. It's God is sovereign. He knows how wicked and stupid and sinful, how we will abuse each other. And yet he still established all this for our good, for, for to be profitable. And so it's not just me and my Bible under the tree somewhere. It's me living in community with the people God's given us being faithful and the scriptures are given to the church and not that the church has this office to uh, uh, give infallible instructions, but God has given his word to his church. So the church is the one to receive it and apply it. And, and, uh, and that's all of us together. So um, I wanted to just kind of hit on that a little bit more. Yeah. You know, God is doing something through his church and uh, he's, he wants to give the whole world to his church and he wants his kingdom to grow and fill the whole earth. So, so God is going to do it with, with our help or not. He is going to do it. But if we want to be faithful Christians, and we want to serve God. He's given us the church as the context to do it. And it's, it's unavoidable as much as we would, like to think of ourselves as special uh we are special but in relation to the good works he gives us to do in his church uh i think psychologically the modern american has been put in a difficult spot uh because of the things that you mentioned, you know, it's easier, you know, I'll just go do it myself. I'll, I'll protect my family from bad people in the church or whatever. But uh, we've, we've also kind of been isolated in our ability to communicate with others in an honest way. We want, you know, I, I guess it's a, a problem as old as time, but we want to just church people. We're going to put our best, face forward. We're not going to admit that we have problems. We're not going to confess our actual sins to each other. You know, I'll tell you about the typical sins, you know, we all have, but I'm not going to confess this sin that I did uh, because it'll make me look bad. And so we, it's hard for us to do church, but God calls us to, to do church, not just play it, but to do it, to really act out these things 
with each other. And it's hard. It's messy. It's ugly. And I don't even know how we really do it other than we try. You know, go have dinner with somebody. See what happens. You know, go spend some time with some people. But see what happens. See what God does. Because he will do it one way or another. And uh, as Christians, we should want to be a part of that. Um, but a part of that, and what we're talking about here, is uh, how God uses creeds and confessions. It's, it seems odd, but, you know, people have done all this work in the past. The church has done all this labor and work. And if we ignore it, then, then uh, we're, we're making it in vain. But what God does through his church is not in vain. Um, doctrines have been developed over centuries by godly men passed down for our benefit through the creeds and confessions of our past. Now we, all, we believe all creeds and confessions are under the authority and scrutiny of the word of God. They are nevertheless beneficial to every generation. We do not simply start from scratch with every new convert, just a man in his Bible. But we build upon what God has given us through the gifts of learned teachers in our past. Creeds and confessions serve as guardrails also for our understanding of Scripture that link us to the faithful believers of past generations and unite us with like-minded believers today, uh, alive today. So there, there's multiple benefits to adhering to uh, the creeds and confessions of the past. So you think of the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, Westminster Confession. Um, there's benefits. You automatically know if, you're, if your church or if you as a person says, I believe I adhere to these things, you automatically have fellowship with someone else who does the same thing. That's one benefit. Um, and also you are protecting yourself from error. So we don't know everything about everything, even though sometimes we like to think that we do. But you haven't studied everything. You, you don't know every single perspective on every issue. Just because you listen to a podcast or whatever, you don't know. But the people who sorted these things out in the past, also with the benefit of having other checks and balances on them at the time and, and through time, um, you can protect yourself from error. So if you have a uh, Nicene view of uh, the nature of God and the nature of Christ, that's going to protect you automatically from the errors of Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness cults. Uh, if, if you believe in the Apostles' Creed, that's going to protect you from errors going towards, like, say, Islam or another false religion uh, that, that claims to be of the Abrahamic faith. It, it's going to protect you. Now, uh, what about the Westminster Confession of Faith? It's so big. Apostles' Creed is so short and so simple, right? Nicene Creed, a little bit longer, but still pretty simple, straight to the point. We get something like the, the Westminster Confession of Faith. It's larger. It can be in... Uh, Intim uh, it can intimidate us. Um, and I think our tendency is to really judge it. I've noticed that about myself in studying it. Like, I'm just waiting. I'm going to find what's wrong with it, this thing. But uh, it really is uh, faithful. It's a faithful document. It's a faithful confession. Uh, so our actual, our church's statement uh goes like this. It is the duty of the church to publish what it believes from the word of God. So we can just say, I just believe the Bible. Here it is. But, you know, what does that lead to? Well, I believe the Bible too. Well, then you just argue about what it means, right? Uh, but then our, our church, our denomination, uh, we adhere to the Westminster Confession of Faith together with the larger and shorter catechisms and the apostles and Nicene creeds. We hold that these confessions and creeds are faithful summaries of the basic fundamental truths of scripture. And I have that in bold here because 
Uh, they are summaries. We still, a part of our church's constitution is actually the scripture, right? The whole word of God. But we believe that these things are, are faithful summaries. And, and therefore, we can go to these documents to resolve issues without having to have a whole debate over every single passage of scripture that might relate to a certain issue. Uh, within our church, we have already agreed that it is a ruling document. Uh, they form our constitution, guiding our interpretation and instruction of scripture while remaining subject to the supreme authority of the word of God. Uh, let's see if I have anything after this. So basically, that's our, that's our view of creeds and confessions. We could talk about people who say, you know, the old trope, uh, no creed but Christ. There's, there's plenty of people out there. I know some related to some people that would say that. But then at the end of the day, they've got all kinds of other beliefs, too. They, do. they, they have more creeds than Christ. And also no creed for Christ is a creed. It's a self-contradictory statement. It's a creed in and of itself. Um, and actually, what it ends up being is a creed of the individual's authority. And it's really unable to be tested because when we write you don't know when i write down our creed in our constitution guess what we can do with it you can scrutinize we, it we can scrutinize it with the scriptures right we wait, wait a second does this fit the scriptures does this match the scriptures and then you actually can't it can be held accountable it can be updated it can be changed it can be edited to fit our highest authority but those who usually say I have no creed but Christ or, or refuse to follow creeds and confessions, um, they're just placing their authority on par with Scripture often, right? It's usually, well, I just follow the Bible or I just follow Jesus. And what they mean is all my opinions are right. somehow what I find in Scripture. Those are, it's not that my opinions are all based off of Scripture. It's, all my opinions I read into scripture. It's very easy to do. Right. And also you cannot scrutinize that because where's, where is their beliefs? Where is their understanding? It's just up here in their head and they can change it whenever they want to. So you can't nail anything down. You can't come to any real agreements that, that uh, won't change over time. Uh, so you that makes fellowship pretty difficult in and of itself too right because they can change their understanding they can change their mind you might not know it and you and unless you talk to them about every single possible thing you don't know if you are in agreement you don't know if they're correct about things either well by having it written down and uh, you're able to now work together. Right. Because now you have the, the lines of our, our unity are spelled out for us. Right. That's why uh, uh, creeds and confessions don't go into every single detail there is to, to do, know about what Scripture says or every position, because then you'd be dividing over even smaller issues. But they give you the big, broad things. They give you truths that are important that enable you to work together. It enables you to hold your pastors and elders accountable, right? Because now you know this is what we say we believe that the scriptures are teaching. This is what we're going to be held accountable to. This is uh, when we go to ordain men. Do they believe this? Or so I have found that there are, Men, I think, that want to introduce other teachings, and they're very quick to disregard the confessions. And as well, these are just the things of men, and they are. But why do they do that? Why would you say that, other than to say you believe your position is is better, which is fine and dandy, but just at least just say that. <laughs> you know, it's like I think they were wrong here. This is where it's right, and here's the scriptures. But to simply say, no, we don't have a creed. Or I'm not going to follow these things because they're all man-made. <clears throat> well, you've, you're just following yourself. Right. And there are obviously different 
confessions and things too that churches adhere to. Mm -hmm. uh, we believe that the Westminster Confession of Faith is uh, one of the best, you know, documents that's ever been compiled to summarize the the teachings of Scripture. We're not saying that it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. We're not saying that it's perfect, inerrant, infallible. But we're saying this is a good place for us to unite. This is a good place for us to hold our ground to. And, uh, and we believe these are faithful interpretations, summaries of this, the truths of Scripture. And if they are, then in those senses they are inerrant, they ought to be obeyed. Right when Scripture is applied, even though it's not in the words of Scripture, but it's the the truths of Scripture are spoken; those truths are to be obeyed. Right. So we do it, we do believe that it carries authority in as much as it reliably uh, summarizes and teaches what the Scriptures teach. Uh, it also gives us a place to um, a place to to start teaching the whole body sort of the same things because everybody comes from different places with different levels of education. But if we have this as a, a document that we can agree upon, it's short enough that you could read it and, and study it. It's not going to take you years. You know, it might take you years to unpack everything, but it's not going to take you years to get the gist. Then you have a baseline, um, you know, you could tell every single person in our church, Joseph, start reading Genesis January 1st. You're going to start reading Genesis. I want you to read all of this. You can hold everybody accountable uh, to a Bible reading program or something like that. But we, you know, that, what, how hard would that be for you? But we can, but this, uh, the confession allows us to have a summary, to have a, a shorter document to have a lot of things compiled and, and compressed into deep truths. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really have too much more to add about that. I mean, it seems pretty obvious to me that having a faithful summary of scripture is a good tool. Yep. You should use it. Yeah. And, and it works as our, again, in our church, it works as the Constitution. And you think about, again, it's interesting how these connect to our civil government. Our Constitution in our country is the guiding document, it, 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 what is supposed to limit the authorities and, and give the powers to the governments and, and let us know what to, to guide by. It. But <clears throat> as Christians, we don't hold that the Constitution is holy inspired word of God, but we would hold that it could be corrected, right? It can be amended. Why can it be amended? Well, because what are you trying to amend it to? To the truth, right? That's the reason you have amendments to the constitution, which really is, should be following the law of God. And it should be able to be amended in that kind of way for civil government. Well, the same kind of deal here is, the Westminster follows is is the Westminster is our constitution, in that that's what governs our church. We're not going to go outside of it, but it's amendable to the Holy Scriptures, and and so it is a and we call it a sub authority, sub standard in a sense. Not that it is below the standard, but a. Uh, a standard that's below scripture, and yet it's still the highest standard in our church outside of scripture. And it's right. always answerable to scripture, but it, it, it governs us. Those are good. It's a good tool. It's a good rule to have. And that's why we're, we're spending time on it. Yeah. And we, like we said earlier, we want to uh, major in the majors and the confession does a good job of, organizing and explaining the majors of our faith. Um, the proof is in the pudding, you know, as well. Go through it, read it, think about it. Think, think of why it words things a certain way. It's impressive. Well, now let's talk about a very important principle 
in, that's used in our confession, which we've been using some of it here. Yeah. That is, this is vital. So good and necessary good. consequence. Yeah. Good and necessary consequence. Uh, this is one of those kind of things where we've already done it, but we're going to explain it and then keep doing it. And you're going to realize that you do it all the time. Not just with the Bible, even. Uh, good and necessary consequence is of the mu- utmost importance when we are talking about God's revelation. We understand that it is not only that which is explicitly stated in Scripture that teaches us, but that which must unavoidably be extrapolated and inferred also has bearing upon our beliefs and behavior. Uh, the book mentioned uh, earlier there, the divine right of church government, puts it like this. How does it appear that scripture consequences are to be admitted to prove any particular doctrine or truth or doctrine? Here's the answer. Because God has formed man a rational, intelligent creature capable of searching out the plain meaning and import and also the necessary consequences of his express declarations. We find Christ's reasoning by a deduction of consequences when he showed that the doctrine of the resurrection was revealed to Moses at the burning bush, that the sixth commandment forbids angry words, and that the seventh uh, lascivious looks. That's in Luke 20, Matthew 5. Um, And a great part of the inspired epistles to the Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews consist in such a deduction of consequences. And as all scripture is said to be profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, without a rational deduction of consequences, every portion of scripture cannot answer each of these valuable ends. So what we're talking about here, good and necessary consequence, is over against the plain explicit thing of scripture. So... Thou shalt not murder. Right. Right. Plain, explicit. We all grant that. But are there any implications or consequences of that command that we deduce from that? We think, we use our mind, that are necessary, that flow from it, and are good. If so, then not only that very explicit thou shalt not murder, but all the good and necessary consequences of that are, um, what were we going to say? They're, would, they they're are authoritative. authoritative. They're true. They're binding. That's the word, binding and authoritative on us. For example, with thou shalt not murder, the opposite of that is inferred, which is that to we should protect life. life. And so that means then from good and necessary consequence, we have the duty as part of God's Ten Commands to preserve life, which would include self-defense. Right. And we see that also played out in other parts of Scripture. So you can make that deduction from good and necessary consequence and also support it and uh, shape it by what the rest of Scripture teaches. So we have the principle that scripture interprets scripture guiding our reasoning of good and necessary consequence as well. Um, yeah. The, but the examples, point we're making here is you don't have to have a specific verse that says thou shall not look at porn on your computer. Right. Uh, and that, so the examples here are that are given uh, is that of Christ uh, when he rebukes the uh, Sadducees to prove that they were wrong about the resurrection, he reasons from uh, Moses in the burning bush. And that text is when he says um, he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and God is a God of the living and not the dead. And so he didn't, Christ didn't go and say, look at uh, the book of Daniel when it talks about them rising from the dust. Well, the Sadducees 
didn't really believe in the book of Daniel completely anyway. So he had to go to the one of the first five books that they agreed with. And there is not anything in there that explicitly says, you know, he will come again to judge the living and the dead on the last day. Um, so he reasoned from good and necessary consequence. And that was the Lord Jesus Christ. He made a good argument. It wasn't a bad argument. And in doing so, he refuted them. Uh, and he also reasons this way when he's uh, at the Sermon on the Mount talking about, you've heard uh, it said, is it do not murder? And, and I say to you, if you're angry with your brother in your heart, you've committed murder in your heart. And he, and he does the same thing with lust. You know, you've heard it said, that do not commit adultery. But I tell you, if you've looked at, at another woman with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery. So he's reasoning from good and necessary consequence. Adultery means, typically, what, I mean, what's the the concrete definition of adultery it's to fornicate with someone who's not your wife right but christ says and it means a whole lot more than that and yeah but, and he's using the consequence well if that's wrong what about looking at someone that's not your wife in a lustful way right how do you get there that's one part of it yeah how does it get to this and also that it's it's not just a, what you do in your body issue, but it's what's in your heart and mind as well is an issue. Um, so he's basically taking all of what Scripture says about God looks at our hearts and all these things, and he's applying that in these commands for us. So he's not making up stuff. He's actually, I mean, he's exegeting Scripture. He's exegeting yeah. Scripture, right. He's using good and necessary consequences. He's reasoning from the scriptures. And uh, the Divine Right of Church Government book here uh, points out Paul does the same thing in the epistles to the Romans, Galatians, and in Hebrews. There's, there's all kinds of reasoning like this throughout the scriptures. Think about um, Paul talking about you shall not muzzle the ox as it treads the grain. What, and what's he reasoning from? An animal husbandry of law in the Old Testament about why pastors deserve to be paid for the work they do in the church. Uh, that isn't just like an abuse. He's not abusing the text. He's reasoning from it. And he's not hyper-spiritualizing it. What he's doing is saying, if it is true that you don't keep an animal from enjoying the fruit of its own labor. How much more the spiritual shepherd that God has given you would you keep from enjoying the fruit and having fruits from his labors? So uh, it's there's reasoning there from the lesser to the greater. Right, that, and... Paul doesn't even have to spell that out. You can tell that that's what he's doing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so they point out here that all of Scripture is said to be profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. If all of Scripture is supposed to be profitable for uh, teaching and instructing, correcting, reproving, then we need to be able to understand it past just its uh, black and white immediate context uh, interpretation. It, it, we need to be able to interpret the text into broader context and apply it to all of our life. If we can't do that, then what it says here in 2 Timothy 3.16 would not be accurate. All of scripture wouldn't be profitable mm -hmm. for all of these things. Um, so I, I've got some examples, some more examples of how we do this normally. Uh, the Trinity, the, nowhere in the scripture does it explicitly say in one passage, one verse, one chapter, spell out the doctrine of the Trinity for us. 
we examine multiple scriptures and what you know the Bible teaches about there being one God, the Bible teaching that the Father is God, Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit is God, but the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not the Father. We take all those teachings together and we come up with the doctrine of the Trinity, but it isn't explicitly spelled out in any one particular place. We let women take the Lord's Supper. There are no examples, I dare you, of women taking the Lord's Supper in Scripture. Not explicitly. Uh, generally obeying traffic laws. Why do we do that? Does the Bible say you on I-65 north, you have to drive 55 miles per hour? It, well, it doesn't. <laughs> it, but we have scriptural reasons to drive the speed limit when we're going on I-65 north. There, there are reasons to preserve human life. Driving uh, can be dangerous if we don't all sort of kind of keep the same speed, pay attention to what we're doing. And those traffic laws help us to do that. We're preserving life. Um, the stairs on your house being safe, it's the same thing. Uh, the Bible teaches about the railings on the roof. They spend a lot of time on the roofs. Uh, that can be applied to keeping your swimming pool safe so that no little kids drown in it, right? Or don't have a an uncovered well on your property that somebody could fall down. It doesn't say that in Scripture, but... It's certainly obedient to scripture to not have someone fall down a well in your yard. Um, teaching your kids to read. We had some good conversation about this. The Bible doesn't say teach your kids to read. Is it biblical to teach your kids to read? Why? Why? I mean, you, you the scriptures teach us to read it, right? To, to the <laughs> word of God. All right, right, and how can a young man keep his ways pure? Right, it, it's by the word of God. Then it's by good and necessary consequence then that he's able to read or to understand it being read to him at the very least. Right, there's education involved to understand the word of God, and if you look at, uh, for example, Psalm one nineteen, that verse I quoted. Uh, it's written, it's long, the longest chapter in the Bible, but it's about the word of God and the wisdom that comes from it. And it's written in a way that is a mnemonic. That is every section begins a different letter of the Hebrew right. alphabet. So it's actually a way to teach your children the Hebrew alphabet. It's a way to teach them to read itself. And so uh, um, it's certainly implied that it's, Good and necessary for your children to read. This is why Christians everywhere they've gone have worked to improve the literacy rates of places around them. You go to anywhere where missionaries, particular Protestant missionaries have been, the literacy rates are higher. Right. But Joseph, you didn't give me the verse. Where's the chapter and verse? Thou shalt read in Hesitations, chapter 2. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just say that to point out how, how silly it is to require a, a chapter and verse proof text um, when you can reason from multiple scriptures, not explicitly, but this, those scriptures about uh, a young man keeping his way, by the word of God, yep. scriptures about parents uh, instructing their children to, to know and fear the Lord. It makes sense that you would teach your children to read in order to obey those scriptures. What if your child is blind? You can still teach them how to learn the scriptures, right? Yeah. So, so you're responsibility changes given the context but you're still or how you keep up with that responsibility changes given the context but you know it would be foolish not to teach your children how to read 
also. Mm-hmm. What, what, a, what a curse it would be to them if you allowed them to grow up not being able to read street signs or... Well, it would be a disobedience to God's word is what right. you're saying. Not just even just a matter of wisdom. It's a disobedience to God's word, not to teach your children. Uh, uh, to it, it, Again, I want to give some context to it. Like you said, a blind person or maybe some exceptions. But to refuse to teach your children to learn, to be able to read scripture, um, is disobedience to the word of God. It, it's disobedience. It's failure as a parent. You're, you're not doing the responsibility that God has given you. And we could give more reasons. We've already given enough, I think, but we could give more reasons why that's true without the scripture explicitly saying, you know, on, by the eighth year, your child must be able to read uh, 60 words a minute or whatever. Yeah. It doesn't require that uh, for us to know that it's true and believe it. And hold each other accountable for it. You now, don't have on there. You're missing. Oh, no, it's under etc. There. I see it. You have teacher children read it, etc. And by good and necessary consequence, that means baptize your children. But we'll. <laughs> no, that one you have to have a chapter and verse for. It. You have to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, now, anyway, anyways, let will bog this down. Get us into what it means to be good and necessary, because that's the, the most important part of this. So there are some things that are matters of wisdom, or the light of nature, uh, right. prudence, godly wisdom principles from Scripture, but they don't necessarily put us on a requirement of to do this or not do this is direct disobedience to the Word. Right, but but uh, uh, there are other things where it's like no, to not do this is direct disobedience to the word. So, what's the difference between good and necessary, and versus godly wisdom that flows? Like, I'll throw out an issue: is homeschool a good and necessary consequence of scripture, or an issue of wisdom and prudence that scripture may shed light on? Okay, so that depends on the circumstances. Uh, the scripture doesn't prohibit schools, right? No. Okay. A school could be a, a tool that you use. You're responsible to make sure that your children are educated. You could supplement uh, some of your work in that with a school. Uh, do you have a school? that isn't going to corrupt your child available. If you do not have, if sending your child to the only schools that you have available is going to uh, corrupt your child and work against their uh, learning about and fearing God, then you should homeschool, right? Yeah, but you're, you're given an issue of wisdom here versus what is good. It's so the point I'm getting at here is it is not a good and necessary consequence from Scripture that homeschool is the only method or the op, the, the required method of training your children. What right. you're doing is you're actually you're not you've moved from good and necessary consequence to biblical wisdom and using something that you you uh, you use some good and necessary consequence, which was. It is from Scripture that we are to give our children a Christian education, right? And that we're we're not to send them to, uh, we're not to give them a pagan education, or to to put them to be in places where they would be corrupted. Right? Those are all the good and necessary things. Now you're applying that in a particular situation, and I think that's where you're getting issues of wisdom versus good and necessary. So maybe. Right. You've got it okay. written here in front of us. Let's walk I, through that. I see what you're saying. But I'll read this and then we'll talk about homeschool afterwards. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll try to apply it. Uh, consider that our logical deductions from Scripture are to be both good and necessary. It may be good to eat a piece of apple pie or give everything we own away to charity. 
but it does not necessitate that we must eat a piece of apple pie and give everything away simply because it might be good in some sense. So uh, being good and necessary is what makes an extrapolated teaching binding, the necessary part. Necessary meaning that it is a logical conclusion that cannot be avoided. It may not be explicitly necessary to attend church at 10.30 a.m. on Sunday, but the light of nature and Christian prudence suggest 2.30 a.m. is not a good time. Uh, but it is necessary to attend, attend church when possible, and if it starts at 10.30 on Sunday, then you should go to church at 10.30 on Sunday. This is not arbitrary, but it throws from a logical connection between all known factors. A good and necessary consequence from Scripture takes into account the whole counsel of God and helps us to, uh, to rightly apply it directly or indirectly to a particular doctrines and circumstances. In doing so, we are not adding any premises to the Scriptures, but we are drawing conclusions from the premises already contained within. So what you're saying here is, there's nothing in scripture that we could apply that said that that that's explicitly says church must meet at 10 30. Right. Nor is it a, a, a good and necessary consequence that it must meet at 10 30. Though there's good wisdom reasons for why it might meet at 10 30 instead of 2 30 AM. You could have a circumstance where 2 30 might actually be the wise thing. You're in China, you got people persecuting you and, and you know, you can think of a scenario. But what, what is good and necessary and binding on us is that we are to go to church and that God has given the pastors and elders the, the authority to establish when it will meet. And therefore, if the church starts at 1030, you're to go at 1030. Right. If you're so, a, a member of that church, you volunteer, voluntarily became a member of the church, it meets at 1030 on Sundays, then unless you have a good reason not to go, which is possible, you should go. And if you're not going without a good reason, you are sinning. By good and necessary consequence, you are disobeying God. Yes. And so there was a lot in that there. There was light of nature. There was yeah. wisdom in the particular of the time. That, that's given to the people that, that can make that decision. You don't have that authority in the church if you're not the elders. You're not the one. Even if you are an elder... You get outvoted by all the elders, and it starts at ten forty-five, right? right? You are, you are to go to church, and you can't say, "Well, there's no verse in Scripture that says we got to go to church every week at ten thirty a.m." So, therefore, I can go play football with my friends every week, or sleep in, or whatever, right? right. No, you're disobeying God there, and it's not a matter of wisdom; it's a matter of command. You're to be in church though it was a matter of wisdom for when they picked it. Right. But the good and necessary consequence is that you do have to go to church. The scriptures do command that. And that's when it is. So that's when you need to go. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, uh, this is important because there are issues that are issues of wisdom and we don't want to bind other people's consciences unnecessarily on issues of wisdom, Christian prudence, right? Uh, uh, seeking to apply things from Scripture. But there are issues that we do bind consciences on, even though there's not a verse for. So there's no verse that you have to go to church at 1030. And yet, because that's your church and it meets at 1030, you are bound to go to church at 1030. Yeah, you are. And because of the circumstances. Yeah, yeah. And uh, because of the scripture that you're applying. And this is what we're trying to get at. There are things in scripture that you, that are implied from the text that are as binding as if they were written explicitly for us. Right? So right. if... if uh, you think of looking at pornography on your laptop. There's no verse that says that. Can't do that. But what's implied by not looking at a woman with lust in your heart? Well, does that mean... I'm looking at the pictures of her. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, 
uh, to the this is where it gets a little comp- complex. You get to the homeschool issue, and now um, you've laid out principles that are drawn from Scripture, uh, and that is we do have a duty to raise our children in a fear and admonition of the Lord. We've already said you're you have from Scripture to teach your children to read, and you've already laid out. Like we could point at scripture says bad company corrupts good morals and other things regarding that. And we can take all these and imply that shh, am I obeying God if I send my children to be instructed by homosexuals, let's put it that way. We'll make it the most extreme case. Drag queen story hour stuff. Well, everybody we don't have a verse on that, but we know because it's Thing. But now let's think of the issue of what model of education must I use? And I think that's where it moves from good and necessary consequence to uh, areas of wisdom. But you, you debate me if I'm, if I'm wrong. No, I, I agree with you. I mean, we do homeschool. Okay. Me and my wife. I do too. Our children are younger, but as they get older, we plan on homeschooling them. But I also am not opposed to if there was a opportunity to send them to a school, we could afford it. It was a good school and it made sense to take them there, leave them. We can do other things and we're, you know, we're constantly supplementing that education and also making sure that it's good. That is totally fine to do that. It's just another tool. It's just like a book. I don't have to write all of my kids curriculum. I can use a book somebody else wrote. And not everything they learn needs to come directly from my mouth. Somebody else can teach them too. I I am responsible that it's good and it's not corrupting them, but uh, there's no reason not to use those tools, especially. So I what, mean, what we're trying to get at here, Zach, is is we want to. There's ditches here, and what we're trying to. And right. I'm not talking about the homeschool. I'm talking about ditches with good and necessary consequence. Right, good and it's good and necessary. Therefore, it's it is binding. not necessary to send your to homeschool your kids. Exactly. So we don't want to. It, it could easily be taken. Uh, here's the ditch that could come with good and necessary, is that every one of my opinions, without a scripture and verse, becomes good and necessary from scripture, right. and I imply them on everybody else and bind everyone's conscience. Uh, uh, that's not what we're saying. We're also on the other ditch saying that scripture doesn't need, we don't need explicit verses for obedience to scripture. Uh, when we are to take what only scripture says, but also what it implies and, and deduce that and therefore obey it. Right. So the debate, I guess, really happens on any particular subject then of what is necessary. That's probably where most of the conflict arises uh, when we're trying to interpret and apply scripture is what interpretations are necessary. But put that aside for a moment and agree at least with this, if it is a good and necessary consequence, then it is binding. Yes. And then it might be it might be a matter of someone grasping, wrestling with an issue to come to that conclusion. But then once they have, it's as binding as one of the Ten Commandments. And we uh, the reason this is so important as we introduce the Westminster is that uh, um, our confession uses this often right in the proof text that they give we, we talk about those some other time but in the things it is deducing from scripture giving you explicit and implicit uh meaning and uh we need to be able to do that work right well I are think, we go ahead i i think that that's actually another benefit of studying the confession is you can start to think that way 
it, it teaches you to think that way about what you're learning from the scriptures. Uh, it's an exercise in good and necessary consequence in a lot of places. It's just another benefit. Uh, this is actually what the confession itself says um, here. Uh, the whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life, is either expressly set down in Scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture, unto which nothing at any time is to be added whether by new revelations of the spirit or traditions of men. Um, this is the thread we were, we were, we were uh, uh, walking there, the, the good and necessary consequence, and then not add anything to it, our own right. opinion, right? Uh, so uh, um, the counsel of God uh, is found in Scripture or the good and necessary consequences deduced from it. Well, hey, um, I think we have done a good job of kind of setting the back some background issues dealing with the Westminster Confession of Faith. Uh, we haven't got to talk about the history of it yet, but uh, I'm going to deduce that we've gone two hours. So that's uh, <laughs> I think uh, uh, we'll be coming back. Maybe we'll come back and have you do this section on the history of Westminster on a different section, and then we'll begin start diving into it and uh, um, walking through a lot of the things that we've already outlined are parts of it. We wanted to kind of highlight these things at the beginning because there are areas that once you get through the, some of those disagreements, now we can dive into it in the future. So, Zach, before we wrap up in this this session on the Westminster, any closing thoughts of any of the things, maybe kind of tie this all together for us. Well, if anybody's actually listened to this whole thing so far, thank you for coming along. It's not the, uh, the hottest topic. It's not, it's not like, uh, it's not the sexiest, uh, theological topic out there today. We could be talking about more about baptism or, we could be talking more about the drag queens and everything, but this is important backbone, fundamental type stuff that um, you have to constantly go back and wrestle with, you know, think through how you're thinking uh, so that you know that you're thinking right. And, and that's what we're doing right now. We don't want to be uh, knee jerk reactionaries. Um, we want to be stable and grounded and understanding the creeds and confessions, our history, uh, how the church should operate. That is going to ground us so that we're not blown about by every wind and doctrine that comes our way. I think this thing, will, this will stabilize us. So um, good for you. If you made it this far between <laughs> me and Joseph, talking about this subject and uh, I think it'll be profitable for anybody that, that comes and please uh, chime in on the, on the comments or send emails or messages or whatever to, to interact with the subject. Cause it is an important one. Well, Hey Zach, I appreciate your time today. Um, uh, as far as the podcast goes, I'll be releasing episodes with Zach from uh, here to whenever we finished, but uh, it also releasing other episodes along the way. So uh, uh, I'll have a few other interviews lined up, try to kind of balance it out and mix things out for you. But uh, stay tuned for more of this. And, and uh, 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 I think you'll be encouraged as well.